I want you to stand up to your feet, love church. Let's show love and appreciation and honor for Chad Robichaux. Chad, before we get into the interview, I want you to just give a brief overview of Mighty Oaks Foundation, as well as, if you would, the Legacy Week that Lee talked about on this video, uh, because there would be, you know, I think some people here that maybe aren't familiar with church, aren't familiar with Mighty Oaks, and, uh, and maybe could use it. So just yeah. talk a little bit about it. Well, first, first good morning, Love Church, uh, and uh, Pastor Josh, Brittany, Joanne. Uh, it's so good to be back with you guys. I'm watching this this morning, and it just really captured my heart. Uh, how proud Pastor David would be of you, and I know he is. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, you guys, those that know, my, uh, this church is just such a big part of uh, of Mighty Oaks, and has been from the beginning uh, of us starting. But Mighty Oaks began with with me. That same story that we saw on this screen with Lee. Uh, you know, I, I came home from my aid deployments to Afghanistan. I dealt with anxiety, depression. I had uh, almost lost my family, and uh, and dealt with debilitating panic attacks, and and almost almost took my life in 2010. And uh, beyond that, uh, that moment, I found restoration through a relationship with Christ. Uh, and then um, a deep burden was put on my heart to help other people. And we started Mighty Oaks Foundation. And over the last 12 years, we really done do four things. One is our resiliency programs, where I go around ba- to bases around the world and speak to active duty troops on spiritual resiliency, PTSD, anxiety, depression, suicide. And we've, been a- we've been blessed to be able to speak to about a half a million active duty troops Absolutely. in the last 12 years. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we provide a lot of resources. Uh, we give, we've given away almost 350,000 of the books that I've written to our troops. And then we have a recovery program, the Legacy Program, which, which Lee was talking about in that, in that video. Um, we do 37 of those per year uh, at our ranches in California, Ohio, here in Haymarket, Virginia, two in Texas. Uh, we do in, we, we've done 4,500 4, graduates over the last 12 years, but now we're doing about 1,000 per year all for free for active duty service members, veterans, first responders, and spouses. We do about $5 million a year in, in programming. Again, all for free because of a great foundation. And, and if you guys might not know at this church, you guys are a big part of financing that and uh, coming out and serving uh, at, at the center. So thanks to this church for and all you guys do for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, another thing we do is, is veterans policy. So we use the faith-based successes that we've had in Washington, D.C. to affect veterans policy. And I was, I was the chairman of the White House's faith-based coalition. We've been able to change, ex- we got executive order signed and change policy to bring faith-based programs back into VA and DOD. And then the last thing that we do, thank you, yeah. The, the last thing that we do is we take our programs that are successful here and share them with our international partners around the world. And since, since February with the Russian invasion, I've been to Ukraine 10 times. My son Hunter, who some of you guys know, Marine Afghanistan veteran is actually flying on a plane right now, flying to Ukraine to be praying for him to bring the gospel to the very front line of Ukraine and his troops there. And um, so I do want to say one thing, though, that's super important for the day. That video uh, is, when I watch that, it really makes me happy because my mission as the founder of Mighty Oaks isn't just to help veterans. I mean, it's important for us to help these guys who did so much for our country, but it's really to help put them in a position to go back to their homes and communities and, and serve and do what God created them to do. And I don't believe Mighty Oaks is the, like, end all to, I mean, I love our organization. I'm super proud of it. But I don't think it's the end all to, to healing. I think the local church is. Yeah. And so it, Mighty Oaks is a conduit to the local church. And, uh, and to, send, to send guys back like Lee and his, and his wife to be able to come and, and go in their church and, and build that outpost. That's what this, this uh, is yeah. about. You guys launching this outpost so veterans and community could have a place to come to get help, go to Mighty Oaks for the intensive and come back here and thrive in their communities and yeah. their homes and their lives. So. I just think it's so awesome because that vision that you have yeah. is happening with Valor because yeah. Valor wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Mighty Oaks because our group is Mighty Oaks certified and Mighty Oaks backed and they certify us and help support our leadership. And, and so it's kind of like we're teaming up yeah. to make a difference in this community right. and, and, and obviously Mighty Oaks in communities across the nation. Yeah. But I, I want to uh, bring Aziz out now and you're going to hear about him. So we're, we're going to, you're going to hear about him as the interview goes and got to spend some time with him last night. And I'm so inspired. Another humble man, uh, but another humble warrior. Uh, this man is a hero himself and you're going to, you're privileged to be able
able to hear this story. And so uh, from Afghanistan to now Texas to Bristow, Virginia, uh, let's stand to our feet and let's, let's bring a, a warm love church welcome as we honor Azazula Aziz. You can have your seat. Hey, the, the first two things I want to ask you, or I want to ask each one of you that's not written down, is just your families. You, you both have beautiful families. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your, your wife and your kids first. All right, well, so you guys, I want to say this. The first service we sat down, and I, you know, those that don't know me, I'm pretty short. And, uh, <laughs> and so as we sat down, Pastor, Pastor Josh's chair started creeping down. <laughs> And, uh, and I had this moment to where I just felt like 10 feet tall. <laughs> so now he's on level with me, but it was funny watching him down there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, my family's, you know, a, a huge foundation to what we do at Mighty Oaks. Uh, Kathy, it, it was part of my story of, of coming in and fighting for me and rescuing me when I was at my deepest, darkest time and, and just believing in me. And uh, we married, Kathy and I have been married 27 years now. Uh, yeah, and we have uh, three amazing, amazing uh, kids. All, all of them are married. Uh, Hunter, Haley, Hayden, and uh, and uh, they have their own families now. And but Haley came here to this church and did her internship after high school. Yep. And then ultimately went to the, the uh, Highlands Bible College. Hunter went to uh, Calvary Chapel Bible College around that same time. Both my sons went in the Marine Corps. Uh, Hunter again went to Afghanistan, and now he's he, he was part of the evacuations in in Afghanistan, and now he's uh, leading some of our international efforts in Ukraine. And again on this on this on a flight there now. Uh, Two granddaughters, and then one on the way. So very blessed. Yeah, yeah. That's so good. Yeah. One on the way. Come on, let's put our hands together for that. That's great. Love you and your family. Aziz? Uh, I'm married. It's been almost uh, 20 years that I'm married. Uh, it's a love marriage. At that time, uh, when I uh, fell in love with her, love was taboo, according to the Afghan culture at that time. Uh, it was a really difficult time, but, you know, I, I didn't care. I put the bees anyways for them. Now everyone is doing it. <laughs> and uh, Tr <laughs> uh, I have uh, six uh, beautiful children from that marriage, three daughters, three sons. That's awesome. And uh, two of the older ones, uh, they are getting ready for a GED. Uh, Ahud uh, is 19. My older son, Huda, is 18. Uh, uh, they both also uh, work, one of them work at the coffee shop, the another works for, a, uh, the, my son works for a business. And uh, two of the middle ones, uh, one of them go to uh, Magnolia High School, the other one to junior high school, and the two little one goes to elementary school. That's so good. So good. We're so happy, Aziz, honored that you'd be here. Y'all's story is inspiring and, and, and incredible. And we're going to jump in. Chad, a, a lot of people know, but then a lot of people don't know about your military background. So 14 years in special operations as a force recon Marine, uh, eight deployments to Afghanistan on a JSOC task force. And, uh, and then last year, and this is the story that, that we're sharing today and, and the story that this book is about, uh, but last year... Uh, saving, safely evacuating 17,000 people out of Afghanistan is just incredible. Um, but, and we're going to, and we're going to tell the story today, but, but what sets the whole story up is y'all's relationship. Um, and so bringing context to how you would work in your special operations role with an interpreter like Aziz. Yeah. So a lot of people probably have assumptions of what an interpreter looks like, uh, in a military unit. And I think the generalization is you get one interpreter that's tasked to a large military unit and they do a deploy deployment and they come back and there's a d d kind of disassociation. If they go back and deploy again, they're going to get a whole different interpreter. That wasn't the case with Aziz and I. So I think uh, understanding the story of, you know, the rescue of Aziz to how that led us to rescue other people is really understanding our relationship. Uh, my job was an AFO, Advanced Force Operator, uh, as part of this JSOC Special Operations Task Force, and uh, in that role, uh, it created a unique environment where we, we worked together independently. So I would go, the best way I know how to describe my job was like being undercover in a, in a combat zone. So I'd go either by myself as a singleton or one other, and one other teammate and work with an interpreter. And uh, in this case, Z started as my interpreter, became my teammate, and ultimately became my friend because we would spend, you know, months, uh, weeks and months uh, alone, the two of us, uh, going out ahead of our unit in the mountains of Afghanistan or across the border in Pakistan to build a clandestine infrastructure to put our assaulters on target to capture, kill, 
you know, the biggest bad guys in the, in the, in the Taliban at that time. And so spending time like that together, you get really close. I mean, if you ever drove, drove on a two-hour car ride, you know how much you, you know, you're by yourself and getting to talk with, with someone and getting to know them. We'd have, you know, 20 hour car rides and and uh, and then we'd spend you know weeks and months just the two of us so we got to really know each other and our about our families and talk about our, our you know our lives and uh, and in those in those times he literally saved my life on three occasions uh, but I'd say he saved my life every day I mean I had the more military experience but he would always put himself before me because he felt like he was responsible for me um, and he would say you know I'd say like you know don't don't eat that don't walk there. You're going to blow up. Like, don't talk to that person. If you talk right now, they're going to kill us. So I feel like he saved my life every day. And, uh, and, and when, we went back to ba- when we went back from an operation, I didn't go to base and he went home. I went to his home. Hatra would, we'd be out in the cold in the mountains. We'd come back and Hatra would make a great meal for us. And then I, I was there when Mashud and Mashuda, his older t- kids, were born. And I, I held his babies when they were born. Like, so he was family to me. And, uh, and, I, and I love him. And, and uh, I know we had this bond t- toward each other. So it wasn't just an interpreter relationship. It was a, it was a friendship. That's awesome. And Aziz, I, I, yeah, you're going to do what the first service did. You're going to want to clap after every answer because it's just so good. And you can if you want. But uh, Aziz, you know, somebody like me, I, I think maybe some other people in, in the room thought like I did. I, I figured, you know, Chad goes uh, to Afghanistan and they just find somebody to interpret. And I was very wrong. And as I've learned this story, I, I've learned how you became an interpreter. Just to explain how. And then, and then also, I think what's important is why you would become an interpreter that would end up helping our U.S. military? Uh, well, uh, when I was born to the third class family, everyone lived uh, in my grandfather's house, uh, my three uncles, my aunts with the children. Everyone was a burden on the shoulder of my grandfather because he owned farms of grapes and peaches and there was no other employment at that time. So my uncles, uh, they were just sitting back and doing the big talk, but my father, uh, my uh, grandfather, he was doing all the hard work and providing the food. So I was really bothered with that and I was really bothered with the environment in Afghanistan. There was no roads, no electricity, no internet, no phones, no computer, no desktop computer, nothing at all at that time. As I was reading, uh, looking into these magazines and, uh, you know, looking to the children of Europeans, Americans, or the other uh, African countries, I was, uh, you know, uh, thinking about this and something in my uh, body was telling me that why are we backwarded like this? What's the problem? And then I found out that it's because of dependency. No, uh, everyone is not working. They are just being dependent on one guy and one guy, you know, uh, do the big sweat and provide the food and everything. So uh, there was also a say at the same time in the neighborhood that uh, there is a natural gas pipeline coming from Turkmenistan to Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Iran. It's uh, generally connecting the region Whoever speaks English, they, uh, they will have a, a decent uh, salary and a decent job. So this was another thing that clicked in my mind. And I, I did a research about English language, which I uh, knew, uh, didn't knew about it in the past. So I started looking around. And as I said, there was no resources. Then I uh, went to the public stationery. I found the self-learning English books which has the English version, the pronunciation by my own native language, and then the translation. I taught myself to speak English as I was reading and practicing, walking in the neighborhood. The, and he was only eight, eight nine years yeah, old. Yeah, eight, nine year old. And the kids, uh, they, at first, they made fun of me. They're like, hey, are you crazy? What are you talking about? You have this paper every day. You are walking. Uh, you are a mad boy and all these uh, fun stuff. So I told, I explained to them that this is international language. If you know this in the future, you will have a good job. You can become an engineer, doctor, go to the pharmacy. All the medicines are by English language. So I kind of explained to them. Then uh, as the time passed, they uh, became interested. They're like, hey, Aziz, why don't you teach us? So I volunteered teaching them, and I became really famous in the neighborhood. Uh, Their parents, they came, they give me a hug. They're like, thank you very much for collecting our children from the streets, from the dust, bringing them for education. And they, they uh, also uh, give me like a fees, like uh, 50,000 Afghanis at that time per month for one student. And I ended up training about 800 students wow. to speak English language. 
And then uh, it was around uh, 1999 that it was one of the evenings uh, I was uh, teaching the class. It was the first black era of the Taliban that this Taliban guy came behind the course and he tried to hit me with a cable blaming me of uh, teaching the infidel language. He called me infidel. He told me that you are going to the prison with us because uh, you're not going to the mosque and you're just spreading the infidel language. So I was young and strong and I was going to the boxing club. I hit this Taliban guy, I punched him on his nose and grabbed his cable and jumped from the second floor, ran away to the neighbor's house. Long story short, I ended up with this human trafficking guy to Pakistan, we got Magden over there, Iran, and then Oman, and then Dubai. In Dubai, uh, after spending a lot of challenges, difficulties, a storm in the oceans, the Gulf waters, so in Dubai, I found this newspaper from a, a burglar shop that it says a house by needed for a Christian family. I borrowed some money from my friends. We were 40 guys. I was the only one who could speak the language. And I called this number using the boot uh, phone, uh, the digital, the one you dial it. And this Christian lady came, uh, she's like, hey Aziz, uh, you are uh, really nice, you can speak good English, but I cannot hire you because you don't have a visa, you don't have a passport. My husband is an Arab from Kuwait. He's radical, if he finds out, he will tell the police and we will go, uh, boot, uh, go, to, go in trouble. And I explained the situation. I told her that I'm the only one to work and all the other 39 people, they, they need food and water. She was a very good uh, Christian lady and then she had mercy on me. She hired me. I worked half a day for her, cleaning her house and all the garbage and stuff. And then the other half day, I bought stuff from the Chinese market and sell them in front of the you know, store, like hand selling binoculars, glasses, duplicate Rolex watches. I was supporting my family. Finally, the, while doing that, uh, the 9-11 happened. When that happened, my dad called me and he's like, hey Aziz, you didn't learn all that English for no reason. This is your time. And I had the passion and I was waiting for an opportunity to work for peace, freedom, freedom of right, freedom of speech, children's right, women's right. This was in me. I was born with it. And I was really bothered in the, in the childhood. So I took that as an opportunity. And I came to Afghanistan. I took the test. Kabul Military Training Center, 3rd Special Forces Group. And I became an interpreter one year over there. After that, moved to the US Embassy, the Anti-Terrorism Assistance Office cultural advisor, chief interpreter, one year over there. And then I was moved uh, in 2004 to the JSOC Special Operation where I met Chad. One of the things, uh, you know, as we spend time together, one of the things I always admired about Aziz was that he, he recognized freedom and democracy even though he'd never seen it before. Uh, and he was, he was willing to fight for it. And, uh, and I think it's just, it was something I always admired by someone that came from America going there, and he would talk about like his, his you know, he didn't have kids yet, but he'd talk about, hey, I don't want my daughters to be forced into a marriage, be sexually enslaved. I don't want my, my sons to be forced to, you know, become terrorists. And, uh, and, and he talked about, you know, freedom in Afghanistan, his daughters to be able to be, future daughters to be able to be educated and things like that. And so he had just had this deep desire to have freedom for his country, and, uh, and he fought for it. And as an American, that convicts us to hear that and realize that he fought for a freedom that he had never seen. And, and we, it is, we don't take it for granted. That's not something that just happens randomly as a nation. And so we're thankful for our freedom. We're thankful for people like you two and, uh, and many out in the, in the audience as well. Um, I want you to share, one of you to share uh, about your last deployment. Um, you've, you've done eight deployments, you've worked together, you're building that friendship, you become very close, but your last deployment went bad. And, uh, and, and you're in great danger. Just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, because of our job, we had a lot of local nationals that worked for us. They were heavily vetted. Uh, most of them were former Northern Alliance fighters. And uh, we had these, this group of Afghans that uh, our government intelligence agencies trained. They vetted, trained them, and they were uh, assigned to work for us. And one of them flipped over to the Taliban. His name was Bashir. I write, write about him, uh, uh, this story a lot in the book. And uh, so Bashir uh, ended up turning us over to the Taliban, tell, talking about our operations. We don't know what he, all what he said, but it was enough to get some of our other Afghan team members, uh, 10 of them, captured and, and ultimately killed. Uh, and then, um, you know, he, I mean, these people were like, you know, friends of Aziz and, 
and uh, we played you know, soccer with their kids and ate dinners with their families, and they were, they were friends of ours, and, we, and I believe they died you know, for us. Uh, and uh, so we took that hard. In addition to that, uh, Bashir was looking for Aziz uh, to capture Aziz and kill him because he was the head of all, all these, these efforts. And then they also went to my house and drove a V-bed, which is a vehicle bomb, into our home, my home. Uh, luckily, myself or none of our team members were there, but we don't know about our guard there, but um, if he was killed or not, but blew up our home. And then I was in a neighboring country. I won't want to say where, but I was in a neighboring country, and a foreign intelligence agency abducted me and uh, interrogated me. And, uh, and so those things created a lot of problems, obviously, for me as a terrible last deployment, led me to going home and dealing with um, the loss, the guilt, the anxiety, the depression, and ultimately going through what, it, what I went through personally. You know, and Aziz went through similar things after his, his service. Uh, we were parallel lives going, went in our own directions, but we both dealt, we dealt with that anxiety, the depression, not being able to do our job anymore, uh, and, you know, ultimately um, finding the path that we're on now. And it obviously ends so in such an inspiring way, but that part of the story right there is after eight deployments, after such strong friendship, and it ends so broken and so badly, and it sets you guys both kind of on a, on a bad course. And so I do have to say one more thing that, that I just missed that's important to the story. So the guy who turned us in, Bashir, our unit, we, we got him. Uh, and, but when we got him, he had like, he had like documents of uh, like where we slept, where our safes were, what time we let all of our routes and times and everything. He had he'd been collecting on us and to try to kill us and, uh, and, and turning all that to the Taliban. So we caught him, he was arrested, Put in, put in a Bagram prison, went to the uh, Kabul, like in the prison in Kabul, Paul Charki, yeah. Paul Charki prison. But then there in the Obama administration, there was a big release of these guys. He got released, and uh, and then went back into the uh, public, went back to the Taliban, became a Taliban leader. And so during the evacuations, uh, right away he starts looking for Aziz, and we know this. So what, I think the, everybody knows about the evacuations happening in August. But back in April, we knew Bashir is looking for Aziz. And, and other other of our team members, and so we started back then in April, having to move him, and he was on a run, hiding from Bashir. Wow. So. And so, uh, as that rewinding a few years, as that ended, that that deployment ended badly, that mission ended badly. Um, it sent you guys kind of on spiraling faith journeys. And so, just talk a little bit about each of your your faith journey um, after between the last deployment, and then obviously we're, we're up to this rescue. Yeah, so for me, um, you know, I talk about a lot in my testimony that I've even shared here before. So my, my faith was very much on the surface. Like I went to church with my family. Uh, my wife was always a strong person of faith. I had to wear Christian stamped on my dog tags. But I always felt like as a young military guy, like uh, and I felt like that was a, a weakness. Uh, I felt like people I saw, men I saw in church were not the men I aspired to be like. And I felt like it was something you do when you get older. And so I really, I believe I put God on a shelf that I could do that later on in life. But right now I have to be violent, I have to be mean, I have to be this warrior. And by the way, I know now that there's no more strong warriors in the battlefield of combat or life than men of God. Uh, but at that time, I really didn't know that or understand that. So I chose to put God out of my life and I left a giant hole inside of me that I feel with hate and rage and anger and bitterness and a real darkness took over me and I, you know, led me to that point to where I almost got divorced from my family. It led me to a point to where I was sitting in the closet with a pistol in my hand trying to decide to take my life and become another veteran, veteran suicide statistic. And it wasn't until I reconciled that question of, of the, the contrast between, for me, masculinity and faith and how those two could coexist that I was able to really be who I believed to be. I'd be a, a, a warrior and, a, and a, a guy that takes on challenging things and not only be able to do that with God, but be able to do that more effectively because of God in, in my life. Yeah, so. awesome. So on my case, so when I was really young, when I was learning the English, I was a really strict, uh, faithful in God. I was uh, trusting the sole sovereign. And uh, then the later on, as I grew up and, you know, I became really famous and uh, I made more money and, you know, house, bodyguards, guns, armor cars. And I became really prideful and I thought it's only me that, uh, you know, reached to this point. I totally uh, kind of, uh, you know, ignored the part of God. I didn't, uh, you know, follow the way I was following it when I was a child. But then I, uh, that led me to a very huge uh, PTSD problem that I didn't even know what PTSD is. In Afghanistan, there's no doctors, no researchers, no uh, quality medicine. Nothing is available. 
I experienced a very bad PTSD. It was a time that, you know, when everyone left me, my guards, my parents, you know, my brothers, all these uh, parliamentary MPs that they once come to my office and they had a drink with me, you know, I was no more that famous guy. Like when my American brothers, one time they called me the Jews of the city, Aziz, the boss, you know. They, they, they give me all kinds of names. I was so, <laughs> you know, ruined up. And then, uh, you know, it, it crashed me. The pride that I had, it crashed me into pieces that I almost shot myself one day. And, uh, you know, I had a bad relation. The wife that I loved, that I, uh, it was a love marriage. I hit her in, her in her eye just because, you know, every day she was telling me to just go out and do something while you're sitting, you're alcoholic, you're drinking, smoking marijuana, all these things. So I, I didn't have patience and tolerance and something was wrong in my brain. So I hit her and I hated my children. But, uh, you know, then uh, something, um, you know, activated in my body and told me that you started it from scratch, from zero, you can do it again if you become a man of God. But then I started repenting and I found me some uh, friends in the neighborhood. We were uh, running in the mountains of uh, North Kabul and I kind of kept myself busy and praying, but, you know, continuously doing that. But still, I was a little bit bothered. And one thing that I forgot before that I tell you as a child, you see these breaks? I made these breaks. I made these breaks for that English course. I made the mud using a wooden box. And then I also made them for selling. Sometimes I see American children, they're not grateful for what they have. You're kidding me, man. You got to be grateful for your parents, for your management, for your leadership. What you have is... More than a paradise, I guess. Wow. So you went on a, a, a spiral, obviously, in your faith. What was your faith at that time? Um, and we're going to fast forward a little bit because that's their journeys. That's happening after that last deployment. Um, but then you fast forward to the withdrawal of American troops in Afghanistan. For you, Aziz, like we were, we're watching the news, seeing, seeing it from, from here um, in our paradise in America, as you say. And, and so we have limited knowledge of that. Bring us into what it's like in Aziz's world. What is it like in your world as the news of American troops withdrawing are? What was going on? Well, uh, I was born to a Muslim family. I was taught uh, to love the Torah, love the Bible, love Jesus, love Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. And I was practicing this and uh, about the withdrawal, as soon as President Biden announced that, I didn't take it serious because I was really counting on the Afghan National Army that was equipped, trained, and given all the required ammunition and guns by the United States military, especially the Zuri units the, that was trained by the CIA, the KPF, the Afghan police. So I was thinking maybe it will take them like a few years before the bad guys even take the, the, the four provinces. But unfortunately, the country collapsed from the top leadership as uh, the, 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 the court president ran away. And, you know, the bottom management, it collapsed. And then, and then uh, I remember the U.S. envoy and President Karzai that they were uh, trying to tell the Taliban in Doha according to that agreement, to capture all the provinces but not capture the uh, Kabul province because then it will be a, a problem. I was seeing the evil coming, capturing the provinces, killing all the SF guys, the Afghan National Army guys, sex enslaving their daughters, torturing their wives, and you know, uh, justifying it by their own barbaric uh, system. And I, uh, my heart broke into pieces I had guns, but I couldn't use them. Internally, I was dying. Spiritually, I was not connected to God. And, you know, my inner, I was losing my energy. My hands became shaking, and I was fearful. It was a terrible, horrible time. I had no other option but to bow on my knees and, and, and ask the Lord for help. Wow. Chad, you're obviously here during that time. Your, your story, which has been incredible. Um, of, of God strengthening you, surrendering to him, starting Mighty Oaks. All of that is happening in the meantime. Yeah. God's strengthening you. So, so Aziz is, is on this spiral. We've got chaos in Afghanistan. Here you are, though, now strengthened and, and had an amazing journey, and, and you make a decision to go 
get him, but talk about why you did that. Like, what made you go, and how did that look when you went? Yeah, well, first of all, like, you know, when um, in April when we were working to get him away from Bashir in hiding, but as I'm watching, you know, President Biden makes this announcement that we're going to do with withdrawal. And by the way, that may seem like I'm taking a political position. I did not agree, agree with President Trump negotiating with the Taliban, nor did I agree with what President Biden did. Uh, but it, it, the whole thing became very, very political. And, and uh, if, if people said that we should not have left, if I, if I say right now we should not have left Afghanistan, a lot of people probably wouldn't agree with me because you heard on the news that it was a 20-year war, it was an endless war, American sons and daughters were dying. Uh, and that is just not true, nor is it consistent with the history of how America handles international policy when it comes to stuff like this. Um, the Bagram Air Force Base is the most strategic place on the globe right now between Iraq, Iran, Russia, and China. And so to forfeit that, give that up, uh, me seeing that happen, I knew it was going to be catastrophic. And when I say it's not consistent, we had 2,500 troops at Bagram Air Force Base. At the time of the withdrawal, we had 4,000 troops. And, uh, and they were working in this international effort to keep uh, terrorism and national security and the global uh, security in the mountains of Afghanistan uh, by keeping the Taliban there. And we were supporting and advising the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police. Historically, the United States always keeps a presence uh, after big wars. We still have 80,000 troops right now in Japan since World War II. We have 40,000 troops in, in Germany since World War II. We have 35,000 troops at the uh, 38th parallel on the, in South Korea since the Korean War. These strategies work. To, so to say we had to move out of Afghanistan when 2,500 troops were there to support and advise the Afghan National Army is completely political and not a smart military strategy. All of our generals advised against it. All of our uh, intelligence uh, officers advised against it. But the White House chose to do it anyway. So I knew that was going to be catastrophic. And, uh, and I, but I couldn't do anything about that, right? I can't, I can't change that. But I know my friend is stuck there. Uh, we had been spending six years on his special immigrant visa po process, which is supposed to only take nine months. But six years we've been to it. This is a guy that did 15 years with special operations, access to top secret information, polygraphed multiple times. And he had spent six years in, it, in a nine-month process. It was a broken system. I know people in Congress and Senate. We could not pull the strings to get him out. So my heart was, was hurting for my friend. And I said, I have to go get my friend Aziz. And I... And I, and I you know, I could not sit back in my house and watch this on the news knowing my friend would be killed and his wife and six kids would be killed because of what he did for me. And so I think it's important to know that, and it's an important lesson for everyone, that when the governments of the world aren't going to do the right thing, you know, people still have the ability to stand up and do the right thing. And, uh, and so we, we just mobilized, and I, I, just, I just reached out to, to 12 uh, amazing special operations buddies uh, from uh, Army Special Forces and Navy SEALs and and uh, some some guys that who uh, served uh, Force Recon Marines and some some uh, paramilitary officers from uh, one of the uh, Joe Roberts sister in laws here Joe Roberts one of them uh, Dan Stenson who's here, here from this community some amazing people that came together and said let's let's do the right thing and and uh, we put the team together to go get Aziz his wife and six kids that was an initial effort but as we're putting the team together one of our teammates brought up my selfishness to say we're just going to get them and said there's 3,500 orphans and let's go get these 3,500 3, 3, orphans. orphans. And so that was, a, that was a, and so when he said that, we were like, what are we doing here? We had the skills and experience. I mean, we, like two of our teammates that, you know, from CIA's ground branch, like it's an amazing skill and experience. Uh, we have the passion to do it. Let's go get as many people as we can. Let's get as many Americans, interpreters, their families, wow. women, children, uh, Christians that be persecuted. And so I believe in that point, God just put a deep burden on our heart and you know, Isaiah 6, 8 says, here am I, send me. Yeah. God put that burden on our heart. And we call it the Task Force 6, 8 because of that. And uh, we, we uh, made the decision to go help as many people as we can. And in that act of obedience, I, see, I believe after that we saw God uh, do what I would say can only be defined as, as a miracle. Mm. I mean, um, I got, I've got a lot of Tell attention. Tell us about a couple of those miracles. <laughs> yeah. I was, so I've gotten a lot of attention for this. I got the Bonhoeffer Achievement Award for this. Congress recon uh, recently recognized myself and, and Dennis Price for this. But uh, the Bible says in 2 uh, Corinthians uh, 11, 11 30, it says, uh, if you boast, then, uh, then boast in your weakness. And that's where I'm at here. So if I sound like I'm bragging a little bit, I'm super proud of what we did. But I'm, I'm only pointing to God because I'm not smart enough to pull off what we did. None of our teammates are. We're not capable of doing that. The only thing we were capable of doing is being obedient to the call that God burdened our hearts to do, and, and we did that. 
And, uh, and beyond that, everything was a divine miracle that I just got to be a part of. When I say this, this miracle in, in, in a period, in any, any one of those things that didn't work, the operation wouldn't have went. And they were all like impossibilities. Like the first one was Sarah Verardo, uh, who's here from Virginia. She got coordinated with the Joint Chiefs, uh, and the Joint Chiefs allowed us to be the only nonprofit to go onto the DOD-controlled uh, uh, Kabul Air Airport, which is HKI Airport, and extract people as a civilian entity, which is impossibility, by the way, and a door that only God could open, but he did, and that made it possible. Uh, secondly, we were going to get people that didn't have visas. Uh, these are people that were in application for a visa, uh, but, but orphans, nobody had visas, so you can't move someone from another country, from one country to another without, without a visa. That's called human trafficking. The only place you could do that is in Laredo, Texas, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I can't help myself to say that, but uh, but but in the real world, we have to follow rules or you go to jail. We had to make sure we had a place to bring them. So we brought them to the humanitarian center in Abu Dhabi. The way that happened was another miracle because uh, Joe Robert and another guy that had relationships with the, with the royal family, we called, uh, the, called the royal family and, and asked, hey, can we bring people here? And they, and they said yes. Not only did they say yes, but we're going to provide humanitarian center, medical, uh, housing, food, everything you need. They rolled out the red carpet. In addition to that, they said, we'll give you two C-17 planes and pilots, and if you fill them up, we're going we're gonna to give you more. And then another miracle, by the way, this all happened in three days. Uh, Glenn, three days. Yeah, Glenn Beck calls, and, uh, and I'm friends with Glenn Beck, the radio show host, and he wanted to do something like everyone else. Hey, this is wrong. We need to do something. So he got the only thing he knew how to do was get behind a microphone and try to raise a few thousand dollars. And he said, I tried to raise a few thousand dollars, but in three days I raised $21 million. Overall, I raised $46 million. Wow. And, and it, he's like, what do, I, what do I do with it? And I'm like, I know exactly what you're going to do with it. You're going to start paying for planes. And so he, uh, Mercury wants his charity. They partner with us. And uh, Rudy Atala, amazing human being, helped orchestrate the purchase, uh, the paying to, to uh, charter those planes and fly people out. And we went in and, in a period of, uh, uh, of 10 days when we got on the ground. Uh, you know, our, our ground teams went outside the airport grabbing people. Our, we were in Abu Dhabi orchestrating this. And, uh, and uh, we... Uh, Aziz got out the first day, his wife and kids, after eight attempts to get them out. And then uh, we were, I mean, no one in our team stopped and slept. Because if you stopped and slept for like five minutes, you felt like you were trading five minutes of sleep for someone's life. Yeah. And so like my buddy Seaspray lost 37 pounds in 10 days. He was just going outside the wire getting people, uh, an amazing, amazing human being. And, uh, and uh, during that 10 days, we had no idea how many people got out. We just kept pushing. But after the, after, uh, the Abbey Gate was blown up and 13 of our service members were killed, the United States military were told to weld those gates shut. And the evacuation was over. At that time, we had got 12,000 people out. And, uh, and the military had to leave. Um, but we realized, like, they have to leave, but we don't have to. We, we're, not mm. for, we're, not for the, we're not being directed by the U.S. government. We could stay. And, and the media was saying, and the White House was saying, there's 100 Americans still there. And I can tell you, without debate, uh, it's not even for me to debate, there were thousands of Americans still there, mm. regardless of what the news said. And, but it doesn't, matter if, it doesn't matter if there was 100 or, or a thousand, one American mm. it should never be left behind. And, uh, and, and where I come from, in my background in special operations, like literally, we will scorch the earth around an American to go get them, even if we know we're going to lose people. Joe Birdall was a complete idiot and traitor, and we lost guys going to get him uh, when he wanted to be with the Taliban. And so that's the promise that the American people should feel when they're in harm's way, that the American military will come to get you. Mm. And uh, so we chose to stay... And, and, and uh, we get a lot of credit for it, uh, to save our allies and Mighty Oaks, but there was a lot of other nonprofits that came together to do the right thing. And over a period of two months, we got another 5,000 people out. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we chose to stay even beyond that. And I think we could talk about that at, at the last part. Yeah. <laughs> 17,000 people safely back. And that's how it happened. Come on, isn't that awesome? But Aziz, there's, there's even a bigger story going on, and, and that's just not even the physical saving of people, but what God was doing in you, and I, I've heard you talk about praying to God before, the, before Chad came, you're praying. Just talk a little bit about that, the time when, when Kabul's being you know, infiltrated and you're crying out to God. So uh, there was uh, I uh, with a failure of a special immigrant visa of waiting six years because I served under a classified contract. The USCIS is asking for a contract number, and yet I'm not able to provide that because it was a classified version. Nobody can touch that. 
And uh, Chad is working hard, Daniel Stenson is working hard, and other friends are working hard. Uh, it's not happening. Chad is telling me, hey, I'm trying hard, I'm talking to these people. And, you know, it's a time that all the provinces of Afghanistan are captured by the evil coming, and I'm watching it, I'm seeing it, that they are coming. My guns are no more important, my bodyguards run away, my parents, my brothers, everyone left me alone. The U.S. military, which I was really counting on them, they don't know me because of the, the classified version of the contract, you know. Uh, I bowed on my knees, and I remembered that uh, as, a, I, as a Muslim child at that time when I was growing, I was taught that uh, Jesus is one of the best prophets of the God. He is ascended to heaven. He is alive. He has a mission. He is coming back to kill the evil, eliminate the evil, and then he will die to go back to the heaven. So I remembered that all my American friends are following him. I bowed on my knees where I'm really broken, crushed into pieces, helpless, disappointed, with a humble heart, uh, you know, with lack of energy. Uh, it was a night. I asked him, uh, and I told him to please, uh, I prayed in, in the name of Jesus. I told him to please tell the Heavenly Father, the Father, who is uh, the creator of Ibrahim, who is the creator of Moses, who is the creator of all the creatures, who is the creator of Mari. And I was praying and asking him for help to remember to my American brothers in their heart, in their mind, that what I did, how much sacrifice I did for them. And because of being an ally of the United States today, my daughters, my wife, and my sons will be killed and sex enslaved in front of me. And if it was just about me, I would just grab my guns and run away to the mountains and I would resist. But what should I do with these six children? So I prayed and cried and prayed and cried. And while I have my guns with me, my wife is holding a gun in one corner. My older son is holding a gun on the other corner. I'm holding other guns and grenades that if they come from this corner, we will shoot them from here. If they come from that corner, we will shoot them from there. We have no other way. Even we cannot go to the relatives because if I go to the relatives, I am putting their life in risk because of me. So I have no other option. Uh, except the prayer, and uh, I was really exhausted because a few nights before I couldn't sleep, and uh, there was a mattress and a pillow, and I went to the sleep. And as soon as I went to the sleep, I saw a dream. In this dream, uh, I saw Afghanistan turned into black. The sky was uh, really dark and cloudy and noisy, rainy. The planes are flying around as if it is World War I or two. Soldiers are wounded, blood shit everywhere, children are crying, women are running around, men are crying. And uh, I saw the whole land of Afghanistan that that's full of dark water, the water from the rain. And I saw myself drowned in the water to this part, to my neck. And there is a, a, the double size of a dry land to this uh, Desk. My family is standing on this one, my daughters, my wife, and they are crying and they're saying, padar, padar, padar. And I cannot speak, but I can see, I can hear, but I'm totally paralyzed. And once again, I remembered uh, Jesus and I prayed his in his name and I told him to please ask the Heavenly Father and tell him that I'm really in a severe need of his help. I know I messed up, but uh, I didn't follow you the way you wanted me to follow you. Uh, and I was really prideful, I was stupid, but please do not give my punishment to my children because of my children, my wife who has nothing to do with this, save me. Suddenly the sky torn and a big hand came like this on me and I got really scared and as I was scared and shivering and I asked him, Lord, please do not touch me. If you touch me, I'm done. So uh, so I look to my left side, there was a black wall uh, on the water, standing on the water. A very big boat hit the wall and came in. Daniel Stenson, who's a friend of Chad and mine, he lives here in Virginia. He's behind the wheel of the ship. And Chad is uh, half the size as he is now. He's more shorter than he is now. <laughs> very strong, very wide. He's pulling the ropes and... Aziz, my brother, hold on tough. We are coming to save you. And Chad's like, hey, man, hang on tough. So I'm like, please hurry up. So, 
When I see my children who are crying, so they came and Chad got my hand and, you know, pulled me to the my ship. And he's like, are you okay, man? And then uh, as uh, they turned, uh, Dan was uh, saying, like, praise be the Lord, uh, you know, reading all the scripts from the Bible and he's doing this. So um, suddenly something happens inside the house and I woke up. But as soon as I woke up, and I'm like, oh my God, this was only a dream. I got more nervous, more anxiety kicked in in me. Nervousness, you know, really disappointed and running around with my gun and checking on my children and my wife to see where is it. Like after a couple of hours, my phone rang. As soon as I answered it, it is chat. He's like, hey, Aziz, my brother. You earned it. We are coming to save you. I'm in Washington, D.C., talking to very uh, high-ranking officials. They know you, what you did for this beautiful nation. They have your documents. Daniel Stenson, Joe Roberts is on their way to Abu Dhabi to talk to the royal family. And then uh, he told me, God loves you, man. Hang on tough, we are coming. And And right after a few hours, uh, Daniel Stenson called me. He's like, hey, Aziz, I'm in Abu Dhabi with Joe Robert. We're coming to Kabul airport. But uh, it's the day that the, the Kabul uh, province has not collapsed. There is still some Afghan military over there. But all the other uh, 33 provinces collapsed. It's in the hand of Taliban. Only one province, the capital, because of the U.S. envoy talking to the Taliban leaders in Doha and President Karzai, not allowing the Taliban to get into the Kabul. So uh, I called this taxi driver who is my friend, and I got my AK and my Glock and wrapped myself with, with a scarf and did, went to the airport and using my cousin who was a border police at the Kabul airport, took pictures and found uh, identified spots when they come so they can process the people like uh, fingerprints, CVP, eye print and stuff. And I kind of did them like a recon all around the airport, how many gates, how many exits, entrances, took pictures and made a PowerPoint presentation and sent him that night. And then the next morning they came, but they kept sending me uh, locations to come to this gate. I'm going to that gate, but I cannot get in because now the Taliban are inside the town. The U.S. Marines are inside the airport. Then the second uh, circle of security is provided by all the Afghan uh, zero unit guys. So the Taliban are shooting at me. The, 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 the zero units are shooting at me. And then when I get to the inner circle of the security, the, the U.S. Marines are shooting at me. And my wife, she had an appendix operation just before the government collapsed. Her wounds are all infected. She's crying. She's like, Aziz, I would rather die in the taxi in the parking lot, but not under the feet of the people. I keep texting him and Dan, and I'm like, hey, man, it's not possible. They need to at least come, tell your buddies to at least come to the, where the U.S. Marines are. I will pass the Taliban. I will pass the zero units, but then... The Marines are not listening to me because I'm all in Afghani clothes and long hair and long beard and they think I'm also a Taliban. I'm <laughs> trying to tell them, hey, these are my documents. I cannot show you because there's Taliban, they will kill me. They're like, no, I don't know you. Then they, they start shooting at me and it was a mess. It was a mess, but I tell you what, guys, God is real. He loves you all. He will answer. The prayer, when you are really in need of him, he will only answer the legitimate prayer. And, you know, he is on time. Thank you. When Aziz says he's on time, uh, <laughs> it's amazing because one of the things when he got out and I went to the humanitarian center, uh, his, uh, we're sitting around and I'm like, I mean, the embrace that we had, it was just uh, going on and on how incredible it was to reunite there. But he says, uh, I said, look at all these thousands of people we got out. It's because of you, because we, we love you so much and because of what you did for us. Like, all these thousands of people were out, and he, he brought something that was so real about God's timing. He's like, all those years, those six years we tried to get the visa, um, we prayed, and, and God never answered his prayers for those six years, but it was his timing because now, if you'd have came get me before and we got out with the visa, you'd have never came get me, and all these thousands of people would not have been wow. out. So God's timing, wow. he recognized that. And... And that level, that airport, like, as he was talking, I was, the, the scenes of the airport were, you have to imagine a level of desperation. Like, 
you, you, you everybody's seen people hanging on those planes and falling off. But imagine, especially for the mothers in here, imagine being so desperate. You're in a crowd, 100,000 people trying to get to these gates, and you know, like, you're never going to make it through. People are getting trampled on, uh, dying of the elements, the Taliban shooting people because uh, uh, of the mess that, you know, the administration had made with, with the policy. So Taliban shooting people outside the gate. And, uh, and women are so desperate. They're kissing their babies goodbye to never see them again, putting on top of a crowd the crowd surf to the gate. And then moms and, and strangers are taking these babies and throwing them as hard and high as they can to get them over the wall because they'd rather them land injured and, ha and have a chance for freedom than be stuck with the Taliban, especially the daughters, to be sexually enslaved forever. And what they didn't realize was on the other side of this wall was six feet high and 20 feet deep of Constantino wire, which you can't encrypt. So babies were landing in there. Joe, our buddy Joe counted six babies that bled out in that, in that wire. And that level of desperation that they had uh, uh, there, it was, just, it was just so unbelievable. Uh, and it was just so heartbreaking to, to know that people were in that level of desperation. But, uh, and, and, you know, that's what compelled us. A lot of people, what yeah. compelled you to keep doing what you were doing? And, and uh, I don't know if you want me to tell about the, the last the part, right? the river operation. Yeah. I mean, when, you know, when everything ended for us and we weren't able to fly people out anymore, it was that, that seeing that and being part of that was like, we have to do something else. And all the, all the Afghans that pushed this place called the Panjir Valley, and uh, the Panjir Valley was uh, where the last resistance would, was Ahmad Massoud's uh, son had l started leading the resistance. And everyone was there, and they were trying to cross into Tajikistan, which geographically is very difficult because it's 25,000-foot mountain peaks. And even if they make it through there, which take like a week to get a family through, and the elements would kill people, even if they got there, they could run into a thousand foot cliff or the Panjir River that in the border is like category five rapids in many places and the, the water is like literally like ice melt. If it stops, it freezes. So the water is so cold. In addition to that, the Taliban's infested that border to block it, uh, to block exactly that, the evacuation from there. The Chinese military went there to keep people in Afghanistan because of those, their own interests. The Russian military had, was on that border and then the Tajikistan military uh, border police was there. And so we knew that they couldn't get out on their own. They needed someone to go on the other side and provide information of how and where to get out. And that just so happens to be my background and what recon Marines do. A long story, I can't, don't have time to share it today, but Staff Sergeant Dennis Price was who we selected uh, to go with me. And the two of us went into Tajikistan. We went about 12 hours uh, across the mountains in the, onto that border. And we spent 10 days on that border uh, and we did built route, uh, getting information routes. We did uh, all border reconnaissance along there, and then we did what's called fording reports to go across, to get routes across the river. So every night, we, every day, we'd scout them out. And again, that's Chinese military, Russian military. Uh, we couldn't have any electronics because the you know the Russian intelligence like intercepting your phones. And the Tajikistan and the Taliban's like literally at times we were like 30 yards from the Taliban. And uh, every night we'd swim into the, that river to go in Afghanistan and build those routes out and provide that information to our government agencies because our government agencies, despite the position the White House had, we had people in our government agencies still trying to do the right thing. They wanted that information. Uh, other nonprofits that were evacuating people, some incredible nonprofits, and then to those people themselves to get that information to them so they could safely evacuate. And uh, you know, it was, it was an incredible thing to be part of. But I think even that operation, you think back of how that even. I had the burden in my heart to do it, but how'd that even happen to be able to get there? You could want to do something, but God has to open those doors. It yeah. was just incredibly uh, miracle to be part of. You know, I, I want to say one last thing. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I want to say one last thing because we get asked a lot, like, you know, why we did it. I mean, obviously, people, I hope now you realize I did it. I started doing it for my friend, but why we continue to go and do that, that work and why we're in Ukraine right now. And uh, the simple answer is because it's the right thing to do, right? And when the government is to the world, I think it's a great lesson for people to learn because we put so much dependence on our government, especially America sometimes, uh, when we shouldn't. But when the governments of the world didn't do the right thing, it was people around the world and, and mainly from America that said, this is not okay, we're gonna do the right thing. Wow. And, and I think we need to take a lesson from that. And, and, and I don't mean just, I don't mean just the 12 of us that went to Afghanistan to, to do that. I mean, uh, it was amazing to see people come together. This church, people praying for us. People don't, I mean, like, it's an impossibility. Like, how am I going to do this, right? The, the Bible says in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we, you walk by faith and not by sight. Like, in sight, it's impossible. Like, to go, 12 guys go, no money to go raise, uh, rescue 17,000 people, it's impossible. With, with God, 
all things are possible. And yeah. he did that. He, he, we witnessed a divine miracle. And, uh, and it was just incredible to be a part of. But I, I think it's important for people to know that, you know, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. And when it seems impossible, uh, and, but it's the right thing to do, even the means and capability within your power to do something on a big level like that or on a personal level every day, you have to do the right thing. And we were just in an interview with a, a guy named Sea Spray who's you know, talked about our, on our team. And, and we were getting interviewed and asked us that question. Why'd you do it? And of course we said, because it's the right thing to do. But then the reporter asked Sea Spray another question that I hadn't heard before. She said, was it worth it? Right? Was it worth it? And he gave the most powerful answer. Um, he said, it doesn't have to be. Right? It doesn't have to be worth it to do the right thing. And I think oftentimes in our own lives, especially in America, we, we put them some oral eye on something, the return on investment, like, I'll do this, but what do I want to get out of it, right? Even as a church, a ministry, like, I'm going to invest this money, I'm going to invest this time, I'm invest this energy, but what's the return on investment? They does not always have to be a return on investment. Sometimes you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, regardless if it's a cost or sacrifice. We had no assurances of our safety, of our success, but, you know, the the Bible and, and God doesn't always call us to do things with, with assurances. I mean, many people, the truth is, many people have died doing exactly what God called them to do yeah. and been persecuted doing what God calls them to do. Eleven of the, of the apostles yeah. died doing what God called them to do. Yeah. There's no assurances, but it's yeah. still the right thing, and, and it doesn't have to be worth it to do the right thing. So. Absolutely. You can stand and clap. That's awesome. special that we're going to do. Um, our Ty Eanes, uh, retired Navy Master Chief, he is uh, on our board of directors here at the church. He's going to come out and give a presentation that Aziz is going to end up receiving um, on, the, on the house floor here in, uh, in a week or so. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Ty to give this recognition. Thanks, Pastor Josh. Hey, uh, church, you know, when, when Pastor Josh asked me to participate in this part of the service, uh, I was extremely humbled and honored. And as I read through uh, the letter that I'm getting ready to read to you, uh, Aziz, I, you know, as a military member, um, you know, I, I thought about our core values uh, across the services, honor, courage, commitment, loyalty, duty, and uh and, and as you all heard, um, and, and as you'll hear in this letter, um, you embody all of those, Aziz. Uh, but the word that really stuck into my head is a warrior. And, and that's what you are, Aziz. You're a warrior. And so, you know, I, I've, had, I've had plenty of opportunities to present service members with awards and accommodations, medals. Um, and, and those things are great. Right, but I've never ever had the opportunity to read what I'm about to read to you. Um, and as Pastor Josh alluded to, uh, we are witnessing American history. This is the first time in the history of America that the U.S. Congress is uh, recognizing an Afghan national for his service. So I will read the letter. Aziz, on behalf of a grateful nation, I want to express our sincere gratitude for your 15 years of service to America while serving as a combat interpreter with U.S. Special Operations in Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom. Throughout your selfless service to the cause of freedom, you continuously displayed sacrifice, honor, and courage in supporting the United States' efforts to defeat terrorism and for a free Afghanistan. Originally assigned to facilitate the day-to-day -day cultural and interpretation operations, your dedication to the mission and impressive resourcefulness ensured the success of countless operations in Afghanistan. Your trustworthiness led to you being used in an uncommon manner, acting as an embedded team member, often traveling with a sole special operator throughout Afghanistan and bordering countries to facilitate special missions. Personal testimony from elite members of US special operations communities attest to your over 100 successful missions in the war on terror in Afghanistan. Great emphasis was placed on your dedication to the mission with testimony stating that you continually placed yourself at greater risk of injury or death to ensure the success of the mission. On numerous occasions, your selfless actions resulted directly in saving the lives of US special operations personnel on the battlefield. 
One of the instances you displayed extraordinary acts of valor after leaving, or excuse me, after learning there were four U.S. Navy SEALs trapped behind enemy lines with no extraction plan. A traditional quick reaction force would have compromised the operation and resulted in increased civilian and military casualties because they were trapped in a Taliban-infested village. This dangerous situation led to your special operations team being tasked with the clandestine extraction led by Chad Robichaud. With the lives on the line and with limited time, you worked effectively and efficiently to develop, plan, coordinate, and facilitate the safe extraction of all U.S. personnel. With disregard for your own personal safety, you commandeered a vehicle and led an all-night mission to enemy territory, recovering all U.S. personnel and their equipment. Your courage, willingness to take action, and put others before yourself were instrumental in safely evacuating those four U.S. Navy SEALs from behind enemy lines, ultimately saving their lives. This example and countless others that cannot be shared due to their sensitive nature underscore the exemplary service you have provided to Afghanistan, America, and the rest of the free world. Your steadfast dedication to your American teammates and the mission of America's war on terror speaks volumes of your loyalty, character, and grit. These qualities are the very traits that make the American people. Mr. Aziz, your leadership, professionalism, and dedication exemplify true American values, and your actions reflect great credit upon yourself in the United States of America. Our nation is forever grateful for your service, dedication, courage, and commitment to the cause of freedom. May God bless you and your family as you begin your new life in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Signed, United States Congress. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. It was my duty. Let me take this opportunity. I know we are running out of time taking this opportunity, asking you guys for a group prayer. Please keep the Afghan women, children, and men. 40 million of people have been kept hostage under the evil regime in Afghanistan. They come behind the doors. They take the women by the excuse of taking them for investigation. They rape them. They killed them. I, I was watching the news last night on Twitter. They killed one of the Afghan female MP, parliamentarian MP. They raped her. They tortured her. They killed her. Every night it is happening. Interpreters are being killed. Afghan ex-army soldiers who worked for freedom, for enduring freedom, for peace, for democracy, for human, human rights, women rights, children rights. They are being uh, executed every day, every night. I believe in prayers. Please keep the Afghan innocent people in your prayers. Thank you very much. Come on, I know you've clapped a lot. One more time. Let's clap. These two amazing men. That's awesome.